StreamYard don't play. They say if you late on Facebook, you can't do it. All right, let's try it again. Yes, I think we have, I, I'm good. Okay, thanks, Lo. All right, good grief now is about to be in the building. We got Ray, we got Facebook, YouTube. I hope we got Facebook, YouTube <laughs> up in here. Let's see what we have going on. I'm loving this. I'm loving this. Mm, we're just going to sit here. That's what yes, we're girl. Yeah. We're going to do all the things. We that's are here. That's, that's what matters most. We're here. Boom. Therefore, all right. Let me see. Any echoing? I feel like I'm good. Did I do right? I think so. All right, everyone. Well, if you don't already, make sure you got a drink. Make sure you got a little drink with you. We are doing a wind down and chill episode. This is a really special episode. Um, if you haven't heard or got a chance to look at the promo yet, but today we're talking about grief. Um, if you didn't see, I kind of put out a little blurb about it. And we always say life happens. That's our little saying. We say life happens. And that's like our way of kind of excusing the things that happen in life that we just can't help, things that are out of our control, whether it be job loss, um, divorce, uh, or, or loss of any type of relationship, um, death in the family, just different types of things can happen. So I see my mom texting me. I love you. I can't read it right now. You might have to <laughs> Facebook me because she tries to keep me together, but I can't deviate from the live. Otherwise, it's going to pause. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about today. And we have our beloved grief coach here. Ray is in the building. Hey, hey, hey. Um, so we're just going to have some genuine, candid conversation. But Ray, I do have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, just to kind of get an idea of what grief really is, um, you know, the different stages of grief that we might experience and just overall but some beginner or some starting things we can do to heal from the process of grief. So why don't you first introduce yourself, let us know who you are and what you do, because you do some pretty amazing things. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I am Ray Kareem. Uh, I am a certified grief coach. I'm a writer. I'm a poet. I'm a creative. I'm an auntie. Love my nieces. Um, I am a pastor. Uh, and that's probably enough things, enough, enough, <laughs> enough descriptions of me. I am a comma. Shout out to Adrian Davis and Malika Holloway. I am a comma, meaning that there is no punctuation to what it is that we do. Like we always, there's always more for us to do. Right. And so, um, yeah, that is who I am. I am a graduate of Mourner. Shout out to We Are Mourner, um, the first Indianapolis cohort. Throw the M's up. Woo woo. <laughs> Love it, girl. Um, nevertheless, it is an entrepreneurial academy that I had the opportunity to um, to participate in. Actually, was one of the winners of the pitch competition. I'm super thankful for that. And uh, I am here to educate people about grief, um, to help people navigate their grief journeys in the best and healthiest ways possible. I love it. I love it. Yes. And I can say from personal experience, you have helped me <laughs> through the process of grief in a lot of different ways. Um, so why don't you let us know just from your professional experience, what exactly is grief? Because I feel like everybody feels it in so many different ways. But what is the actual definition of grief? And you know what might that look like for each individual person? Uh, so grief by definition is a natural, normal response resulting in the expression of feelings and emotions due to loss or change. Um, I add to that that it's the natural, normal response resulting in the expression of feelings and emotions due to loss, change and transition. Um, and some people might look at look at those words interchangeably, but they actually have 
really distinct differences. Um, so for example, during the height of COVID, uh, we were in a space of not only loss and change, but we were also in a space of transition quick transition, transition that we are still um, in some ways recovering from, right? So for example, you know, let's say today is Thursday. So let's say today we have plans, you know what I mean? To go out, um, to meet each other, right? To go have dinner, go shopping, whatever. And then the next day you get a message um, or an announcement comes over the radio or, or over the television that says that the world is shut down. And so those dinner plans that you had literally the day before are no more. And so that's what I mean by, by, uh, by the transition. Um, in answering the second question, when it comes to um, the, what was the second question? <laughs> Just like what that might look, look like. like. Yes. Yeah. Um, grief shows up differently for Every, for, for, for different people. It shows up differently for everybody really is what it is because none of us are the same to the prints on our fingers and our hands are different, right? The, the, you have two hands on one body and each one is different. And so that just goes to show that because of our, because of our differences, the way we process information, the way we receive information, everybody grieves differently. Um, some people grieve uh, through um, visible, excuse me, an audible expression through crying. Some people grieve in silence, right? Um, some people grieve with uh, some of the healthier ways of coping and other people grieve in some ways that are, that are unhealthy, which is what I look to help people to get through. Absolutely. And I love what you said about it being a natural response because it is natural to grieve. And I think that's something that I've learned just through my own process of grief um, is that it is 100% natural. It's it's okay to feel the way that you do. Um, it's okay to go through those different stages. I think there's times where it's like, man, am I like totally losing my mind? <laughs> right. Am I losing my mind here? Am I, you know, on the right path? Almost like, why am I not? over it almost fast enough. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us and talk to us a little bit about what happens if we don't release that grief and allow us to go through, or allow ourselves to go through that process? What can that look like or what might happen? So you're going to go through the process whether you want to or not. Let, let me start there, right? Um, grief is not something that you skip over. Um, it is also not something that you get over. A lot of times you hear people saying, oh, aren't you over that by now? Or shouldn't you be over that by now? Absolutely not. Because it's a process, it's a journey, it's something you go through, but it's not something that you get over. And, and it's gonna happen whether we want it, <laughs> whether we want it to or not. Um, for example, uh, we as humans are not the only ones that grieve, animals grieve. And we could learn lessons from animals when they grieve because they're not like, oh my gosh, can't nobody see me cry? You're gonna get the, these tears, you're gonna get the noise, the, the wailing that comes with these tears. You're gonna get, you know, me shaking my fist or stumping my foot, like foot, whatever that looks like, because we have to go through it. The reason why we have to go through it is because if we don't, if we don't release our feelings and emotions then that, that it sets up in our bodies. One of the number one reasons for chronic illness is unreleased and unresolved emotion. So how many of us are walking around sick when we only really just need a good cry? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know something, you actually, <laughs> you actually confirmed something that I always kind of thought uh -huh. because even in the past, just going through different heartbreaks or different changes, again, it doesn't always have to be death mm -hmm. that causes grief, but it really felt like physical pain. Yeah. And I think the more that I pushed it off and the more that I acted like it didn't bother me or, you know what I mean? Like, I think I was just trying to be this, you know, this strong woman, especially me trying to be a strong black woman. You know, you're not trying to hold on and harbor things for too long. You're like, oh, that doesn't bother me. That doesn't, you know, it is what it is. And you just kind of move on. Life happens. You know, you just kind of say that and you move on. But I definitely could feel 
that, <laughs> you know, holding on to that grief and holding on to um, those emotions definitely resonated with my body. And you say something a lot about uh, things being something about bones, like allowing your bones to heal. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, talk about that, because when you said that, it really resonated with me in a totally different way. OK, so I, so I need us all to hear it. So the whole idea about the bones healing, like your bones healing, right? There's a Chinese, I believe it's a Chinese proverb that says, let go or be dragged, right? So um, the way my mind works is that sometimes I picture things and just kind of add, like I, I have the visual of it and I just add my own, my, my own thing, right? So the way, I, the way I think about that is if you don't let go and be dragged, you're going to get to a point where the skin comes off gonna get to the point where it goes through the muscle if you still holding on and then by the time you by if you don't let go you're gonna get to the point where now your bones are exposed right and and you have to allow the bones to heal so that the muscle can come back so that the skin can come back on right um let's go bible real quick shout out to pastor john hannah because that's what he says let's go bible um <laughs> It, when, when it came to Ezekiel, the Lord said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? Well, the bones can't live if they're not healed. Wow. And so if, if you, in order for there to be life, right, in order for there to be movement, you got to let the bones heal. That The bones is like the, that's like the crux, right? Like that's, that's like the foundation. Because there was not anything else before the bones. He couldn't breathe breath into it. He couldn't command the four winds to come into the bones until the bones had come together. The bones couldn't come together until they were healed, which is why, here we go, when, when you have uh, broken bones or fractured bones, you know, they tell you to, 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 to uh, be mindful of your movement or they'll wrap it or you'll get a cast because that bone needs to heal in order for the rest of the movement to take place. Girl, girl. <laughs> wow. So I take a lot away from that just personally. And it's just crazy to think that our bones in our physical bodies, I think we separate our emotions from that, but our bones and our physical bodies carry a lot as well. Um, they go through the same things that our emotions go through. They experience kind of the same thing our emotions experience. Yes. So even going through this whole thing with my dad, it's funny how sometimes hearing his voice on a video, my heart will get happy. And, you know, my body will respond as if he's here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like then that reminder that he's not starts to, you know, have that effect on the body too. So it's just crazy to think that, I don't know if this is true or not. I think about Frozen, the second Frozen. I don't know if anybody has toddlers out there like me, but how it says like water um, carries memories pretty much. And I feel like our bodies kind of do the same thing, especially since we're made out of 80% water. I don't know. I don't know if there's any truth to that. I don't know if there's truth to Disney, but. Well, you know, there was the experiment um, where there was a, a, a scientist of some sort who um, would speak to the water. And like, it was like, oh, you're beautiful, like, or whatever the words were. And, and he would also speak negatively to, to water in another cup. Oh, you're this, oh, you're that. And you could see the way the water formed. Mm. Like there was a difference in the formation of the way the water crystallized. Or I'm probably not using the right terminology, but I'm sure that it's on Google somewhere. Um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that that was true. Yeah. There's probably some truth to it. Um, because, well, you know, there's that book, uh, the body keeps the score. There's a book called the body. I think I actually have that book. The body keeps the score. Like our bodies remember our bodies remember, right? That good God, that's part of the reason for trauma and mm. shame. And get, like we could go down the list. That's the reason for it because our bodies remember. Um, shout out to uh, my friend Nas. I don't know what her Instagram name is. Forgive me, Nas, but she was the person who said this to me before. I think she went live. It may have been on a live or in one of her posts. Like 
if you experience, let's say um, you're riding, you're riding your bike and you fall, right? And you injure yourself. Maybe it's not too bad, but you have this feeling of, oh, I don't want to ride that bike anymore because the last time I rode that bike, I fell. Well, now you have to create a new experience with the bike that will override, right, the negative experience. Because if that's the case, then that means that you wasted money because you're no longer, you know, you're no longer riding the bike. You're wasting, you are missing out on an opportunity or an experience because because of that one thing, you won't do it anymore. Now, I'm not saying don't be aware. Um, <laughs> shout out to my friend, Sir Doug. He said this to me. He was telling me about a conversation he had with his daughter um uh and how he did not tell her it was something along the lines of like the difference between being aware and being cautious or careful because we mm. grew up hearing be careful be careful be careful well if i'm always so careful will will, will i ever take a risk right and so there's it's a matter of being aware so we have to we have to change the experience we have to change the way we experience case in point when it comes to the holidays mother's day father's day birthdays um, uh, Christmas, Easter, what have you, where we are used to spending that time with family, it doesn't mean that we won't have moments of emotion. It doesn't mean that we can't cry, that we can't release the emotion, but it does mean that we should grow to a place where we can, we can begin to enjoy those holidays again. We can begin to enjoy the memory of our loved one. We can we can look at the car that we used to have that was in an accident and be like, you know what? I had it when I did. I enjoyed it when I did. I'm moving on to something else. We can look at the job that uh, we either quit or were fired from and be like, you know what? I, you know, this was the day I got hired and now I'm doing something else that day. So we just have to retrain our brains, which in essence, we then also, we also give another memory to our bodies. I hope all that makes sense. I feel like it was a lot. It does. It makes a hundred percent sense. Bear with me. I'm gonna try something. I'm mm -hmm. gonna try something. Mm -hmm. take this off. Hold on. Hold on. And then it went away. I honestly have no clue what that is. <laughs> okay. It's gone. I feel like I'm echoing, but I don't know why I'm echoing on. Am I echoing on Instagram? Okay, here's my question. Do you have the volume turned down on your devices? I do. Oh, wait, let me turn it. I don't have it turned down on my computer. So ooh, let me turn it down on my laptop. Okay. When they say a church, when they have their <laughs> technical issues, glory to God. <laughs> amen. Amen. <laughs> it is turned down on my uh, laptop. Okay. Okay. Amen. I'm not hearing the craziness anymore. Maybe that was it. Fun times. Fun times. We're going to see. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. All right. So um, we'll keep going with Instagram. And if you're on StreamYard, we're going to get Ray back in a moment. Um, but we had a comment from someone on YouTube who said, grief has different stages and the length of each stage depends on the individual person and what type of support system and resources they have available. Absolutely. So that is like the number one thing that I've learned just with my process of grief or, hello, there's it all, <laughs> my setup and everything. Um, that's just something that I've learned with my process of grief, just that it really does depend on the person. Everybody's a little bit, everybody's a little bit different. Everybody's resources are different. So Ray, just based on 
your experience unless you're not quite ready yet, which is totally fine. Um, what are some resources that are helpful with someone who is looking to heal and begin the grief process, but do it in a healthy way? And you can take your time. Hold on. Yep. Ah. Hey guys. Okay. All right. And then just make sure your volume's down if you can. Yep. I'm turning it down. Okay. Right now. It is off. The Lord is kind. Ain't it good? First of all, it's good that I figured out how to do all of this because I've been wondering. I'm like, I know there's a way for me to go live multiple places and figure it out. It costs a little yes. bit of coin, but it's definitely worth it because this is such a good conversation and I'm looking to, you know, expand and continue to bring different people on for these wind down and chill. So thanks to everybody for bearing with us and figure while we figure things out. But um, like I said, Ray, everything is with grief. Everything is definitely dependent on the person and their resources. So what are some healthy resources uh, we can gain or things we can do to start the grieving process in a healthy way because I, I know the health I know the unhealthy way to do it. We kind of talked about that as far as holding things in, um, not being afraid to lash things out. You know, what are some resources that we can that we can have to help us grieve? Um, so a really great resource is and it just depends like your your family and friends can be a good resource um, depending on what those relationships are like. Um, journaling, writing is very, very cathartic and therapeutic. Like writing is always good because you can be the only person to see it. You can write as long as you want, as short as you want. You can write it with a marker. You can write it with a pencil, a crayon, like whatever. Like writing is very cathartic. Um, so that's always good. I am an advocate for therapy. Um, shout out to my therapist who I'll go see next Wednesday. The Lord is kind. Um, <laughs> so like therapy is always good, you know, um, of course I'm a grief coach, so I'm going to shout myself out and say anybody, really anybody that you can talk to any space where you can, any safe judgment free space where you have the opportunity to kind of peel back those layers and take your time, um, to be able to explore because the, the interesting thing about grief is we are never we are always grieving more than what we are aware of. Mm, that's so true. And that explains always. a lot. That explains a lot because there's a lot of times where I feel like I'm doing fine, you know, when it comes to my dad. There's days where I feel normal and I feel like I'm doing okay because mm -hmm. honestly he lived in another state. So we didn't go obviously this long without talking to each other or seeing each other. Maybe seeing each other we might have. But we definitely didn't go this long without talking to each other before. So it's different. But there day, there's days where I feel like fine and I feel OK and I'm able to function. And then there's other days where I really don't feel like I have the space to function and the space to, to really have that outlet that I need. And I feel like, you know, the number one reason why I wanted to have this conversation, especially for, um, you know, working women, women who are in leadership or in executive positions or in corporate Sometimes you just don't have the safe space to really grieve the way you want to. And there's not a time limit on grief. I remember the number one way I knew that I needed to look for something different with my last job. And, and it wasn't all bad. I'm not trying to bash anybody or anything. But um, someone walked up to me in management and was like, oh, are you feeling back to normal yet? And it had been like maybe a week a week and a half. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be quote unquote normal. I think I'm learning how to function without a parent. I have one parent who's devastated that I'm trying to be there for and help transition and stuff like that. And then I have myself, you know, and I have the rest of my family. So no, I probably won't feel like normal for a while, but I can function, you know, I can get the job done if that's what you're asking, but yeah. No. No, I do. yeah, don't that's... expect me to outperform and perform at a normal level. And that's before. one of those things where it makes me want to like talk to the leadership everywhere, right? Because so, so there are two things that come to mind with that. 
First of all, you have the cultural differences when it comes to the way people process grief, right? First and foremost, right? But then secondly, people never really understand until their feet have to be in those shoes. You know, now of course we're not wishing death and doom and destruction on nobody, okay? Nobody at all. However, comma, when you have that experience, then you 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 will have a different perspective. You have a different take on that thing, right? You just you will. We we don't return to normal when death happens. We we can't. It's impossible. We, we create a new normal. We don't return to what was. We now have to operate in something that is new. And I can't even say what is in the sense because we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know what it's going to be from day to day. Uh, one of my friends, Pastor Corey Duncan, uh, here in Indianapolis, um, I think it was 10 years December that his father had passed, since his father passed. And we did a, um, like a, 10 things for holiday grief or something like that. And he made mention of the fact that this past December was 10 years. And when that day came, it hit him like it was the, the, the like he had just found out, right? So we don't, we don't, there is no roadmap for this thing called grief. There's no road wrap. There is no road map for grief. There's no, you should, it, it's almost like, you, I, I'll never forget this hearing that you build the plane while you're flying, and mm. you can, you know, oh, I need to write that down, girl. Yeah, you build the plane while you're flying because you're figuring it out as you go. Now, there are people like myself, grief coaches, and there are therapists or what have you. People who can give you some tips and tools along the way, but but even we don't know how it goes because I'm not in your shoes, right? I know what it's like to lose a father, but I don't know what it's like to lose your father because that was your father and mine was mine. Do you understand what I'm saying? So those are some right. of the differences. I also want to circle back because someone may mention in a question about the stages of grief. And I am going to be the bearer of amazing news and let you all know that the stages of grief are not what they were intended to be. The stages of grief were originally created or um, designed. They, they concluded the stages of grief. They came up with that for people who were dying, people who were like in hospice care, people who were, right, people with chronic illness, people who were dying. They were never meant for the people who were alive to process for people who had died or for any any loss oh, wow. or any change. Like it was never meant to be that way. Not a original. Know that. Yeah. Now the interesting thing is there were some psychologists or who or what have you who kind of consulted with the person who was the original creator of that. Elizabeth Kubler Ross is her name. And she said herself that she was afraid that things were getting out of hand because people look at the stages of grief as Oh, I went through stage one. I went through stage two. I never went through stage three. So does that mean I'm not going to, that I'm going to always grieve? Well, yes, it does mean that you'll always grieve because you're human. However, it does not mean that just because you did not experience a particular stage that there's something wrong with you because it's right. not, because they were never meant for. Here's the thing. <laughs> the stages of grief are uh, denial bargaining, and I don't know if I'm saying this in these first three in the right order, but you have denial, bargaining, anger, depression, acceptance. Okay? Right. Why would I be bargaining about somebody who died? I was going to ask, what exactly is that? There was really no clear definition of what bargaining means with the person who's still alive about the exactly person. now with uh, a that person, was really confusing with a person who is dying they may put them their their mindset may be in a space of bargaining with themselves right oh my gosh right. like maybe or bargaining with god like god if you let me live five more days i'm gonna get this done you know it makes sense for them to bargain i don't have a, who am i bargaining with right the car was already totaled they already handed you the pink slip. You know what I mean? The, the relationship is already over. The person of who you bargaining with. Yeah. Right. And so 
<laughs> when people when people ask me about the stages of grief, I just tell them to like, just get that out of your head in a gentle way. I say like, we're going to do away with the stages of grief because they can, in essence, do more harm than good. Especially if right. you come to this no, this notion of, well, oh, I've made it through the stages. Now I'm not grieving. No, as long as we breathe, we'll grieve. Because grief is a part of life. Right. And that's something that I had to honestly come to terms with. When we had our conversation, I don't know if you guys got a chance to check it out or remember the last vlog that I did was about me going through the grief process. And I we, just a little plug here. We were trying to have this conversation like three months ago, but I told her, I said, I am just not ready to go live and talk about this quite yet. So protect your peace, people, you know, understanding that it's okay if you're not ready to talk about certain things, yeah, obviously, absolutely. especially on this platform. But when we were talking about it on my vlog, one thing that she said that a lot of people have response to, sorry, my lamp is here and it's making noises. But um, a lot of people responded to when we talked about there's no rhyme or rhythm to grief. And it was more so you said that in response to me recognizing that I actually was trying to control the grief. I think that sometimes the idea of having steps or having a plan or having this or that gives you the idea that you can control what that process actually looks like. And there really is no control. I remember um, after I lost my job, when I used to work at, you know, when I was, was in corporate, I used to do um, these exercises on my phone. I had this app where I could exercise in the hotel and, you know, I would go to the gym and feel like, oh, I'm living my best life. I have this career job and, you know, this corporate job is my dream job and I'm working out, I'm taking care of my body. Like I'm on track to be where I want to be when I'm 40. Like I, I thought that I was on the path that I wanted to be on. But when life happened and COVID happened, <laughs> Um, and I lost my job, I kind of, I felt totally off track and I felt out of control. And I think that when you look for steps or you look for, you know, a plan or something like that, you want someone to almost tell you like, Hey, what do I got to do to get in control of this so I can get back on track? And the other day, I'll never forget, maybe not the other day, like a month ago, I actually got back to working out for the first time since my dad died, because when you work out, you release a lot and I wasn't ready to release anything. <laughs> You know, especially the thought of my dad not being here. So when I went to work out, I immediately went back to a time where I thought that my life was just so good. I had my family. I was grateful. I was able to actually go see them on the weekends. I had a, a great schedule. You know, my everyone was healthy. We might have been quarantining, but everyone was healthy. I was working a great job. You know, I was traveling and I was I was living my best life. So it brought me back to that. And I'm like, man, I feel like I don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that I can really do about it. And I just broke down. So brings me to my next point. Again, sorry about the dinging. Uh, but it brings me to my next point, which is really overcoming that grief. And there is a number one, there is no process to it. And there's going to be hills and valleys to it. Like you said, building the plane while you're flying. Um, but can you share with us really quick about having a safe space, because now we know that holding our grief in is not a good thing. That's going to definitely muss us up emotionally. It's going to come up in other ways, it might even come up in other ways physically that could really affect you and affect your body. So can you share with us about like creating a safe space and what that survivor's guilt might even might even look like? Because that's something that I deal with, too. Um. I know I just kind of threw a lot. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I think I want to start with the survivor's guilt first. Yeah. Survivor's yeah. guilt is, it's a mind trick because, and at the same time, it can feel very real. Let me say it that way. Because you look at it like, but why them, why not me? Right. Or why me? Like, why am I still here and they're not? Right. Like, why do I still have a job and they don't? Whatever that looks like, you know. Um, and we have to process that and acknowledge and recognize that there are things that we don't have control over. We don't have yeah. control over it. Right. 
And so because because survivor's guilt is almost as if we wanted to be able to control some of the things that did and did not happen and we can't. And survivor's guilt can cause a person to spiral, right? That you know, it can put you in this space of, well, well, of feeling undeserving, right? Like, well, I know I'm here, but mm, I probably don't deserve this. I probably don't deserve that. Or you could go the complete opposite and be like, I'm here, so I got to do everything. And so it, it leaves you without a balance. And so that's why I say it's a mind trick because even though it, it feels real, right? It's a smoke screen. Yeah. So we have to allow ourselves to to process that by by reminding ourselves that we don't we don't have control over, it, right? Like I have control over being able to pick up this cup and drink this tea, right? But if for some strange reason my hand slipped, then the then the the cup falls, right? I didn't have control over my hand slipping because I don't know why it slipped. You understand what I'm saying? So so there's no there, then I would just say hold on y'all, Jen is going to play some music. I'm going to pick this cup up, you know what I mean? And be back in five, like whatever that looks like. And so with survivor's guilt, it's a matter of us feeling like we should be, we should have some sort of control over it. And we don't, we can't. Um, when it comes to safe space, any space that you are in where there are other people, right? Any space that we are in where there are other people, and we know that we can express our feelings, uh, whether that's through tears or words or what have you, without judgment, um, knowing that we have the space enough to do it where they're like, hey, if you need to go to the bathroom or if you need to go to my room, wherever, they allow you that, literally allow you the space to like be by yourself if you need to. Um, they're not offended by way of, of however you express that grief. Um, and they are still going to be there with you and for you uh, before, during, and after that process, then that's a safe space. Our homes, you know, when we are not around other people, that can also be safe space. Um, as long as we are not destructive. Yeah. Because for me, I say like, if you want to cry, cry. You want to scream, scream. Some people are going to cuss. I'm not going to tell you that because just don't put my name before or after the words. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to people, like, if you want to throw something or hit something, do it. Just make sure that it's not a person, a possession, or a pet. Right? Like, if okay. you want to throw a rock in the water, throw the rock in the water. Don't throw the rock at a window. Right? Like, but we have to be, that goes back to that awareness. You know what I mean? Like if you feel like you need to hit the air, hit the air, just make sure that there's no person around you or, you know, the the long punching bag, the long, long boxing bag, like, you know, do that, right? Um, so those are what those safe spaces look like. Listen, first of all, I'm glad to hear that you can create some. And I think too, you know, being able to, lean on your your family and your friends. I think that when things like this kind of happen, you you can really begin to take inventory of who's in your life, who's adding to your life positively and who's not adding to your life positively, who's able to um, really see you through. I mean, it's an ugly process. It's not cute. Grief is not something that is cute at all. Like I'm here to tell you. <laughs> You have to have someone, whether it be someone like Ray or, you know, a friend or a family member or something like that. You have to have someone that you can call and be able to walk with you through that process if needed. But, um, you know, I think that it's important that we remember that we're having we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to have the human experience. I think that's something when I get to on the spiritual side of things. You know, you forget that it's okay to have a human experience. I have to remember that Jesus had a human experience. Like he prayed for an hour, maybe longer. He prayed for an hour. Like, Lord, if there is any other way for this thing to happen, other than me being nailed to that cross, let it be. But if not, your will be done. So I think at the end of the day, um, we have to recognize that it's okay to have a human experience. I feel like you were going to jump in there. Yes. Um, and even in that, 
I I actually preached a sermon this past Sunday. Thought I had to sneeze. Um, about one of the instances where we saw Jesus grieve. Um, John 11, I think it's 35. Um, Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. He didn't cry. He wept. What? And we didn't see that anybody like put their arm around Jesus to be like, Jesus, we know that Lazarus was your friend too and that you're weeping because you're, you're human. You are holy human. And holy mm. W-H-O-L-L-Y human, and you are H-O-L-Y human. So you were both and you're having this experience. Nobody comforted Jesus. They was like, You going to the tomb or what? Like we we was headed <laughs> to the tomb and you crying. What you crying for, Jesus? Like why? Because I'm a hundred percent man and a hundred percent guy, and I'm having a human experience. I am having a holy and holy human experience here. Um, it's a matter of recognizing that Jesus wept. Yeah. He didn't just cry, he wept. Hebrews 4, 15 says, we do not have a high priest who is not um, basically like affected by our infirmities and weaknesses. Right. So how is it, like how would Jesus know what weeping was like if he never did it? And that's just one of the instances where Jesus, you know, it's, it, is, it is written there that Jesus wept. But you better believe that when he was on that cross, he wasn't smiling, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Even in the garden, you know, even in the garden, he was weeping. There are particular, there are a couple of um, versions that even say that his, he was, his soul was grieved. Yeah. Grieved. yeah. So we have to, we have to be okay with the process of grief. Sometimes it shows up through tears. Sometimes it shows up through silence. Sometimes it shows up through us you know, going and doing things. Sometimes it shows up to in, in moments where we are still, but it's going to show up because it's a part of life. And as long as we have the opportunity to inhale and exhale, we will also have the opportunity to grieve. Absolutely, girl. I, I listen. <laughs> I'm just like, Talk to me, girl. Talk to my heart. Because, you know, it's so true. And I think about, too, like with the story of Lazarus, like Jesus and all of his power, knowing good and well that he could raise him, still wept and mourned his friend. So, you know, it's definitely something that I have to learn to balance. I know there's a lot of other people, especially um, women as women uh, and men, too. But, you know, I'm, I'm a woman. I can only speak from a woman's perspective. But you know, just having that balance between, you know, having that spiritual experience and learning to trust and lean on God, but then also grieving when things don't go our way, when things don't work out. And sometimes it's you're grieving the person, you're grieving the relationship, you're grieving the job, but you're also grieving the dream. Like it feels like, you know, what the things that I, I used to dream that my parents would, you know, at some point move back to Michigan, I'd have them both, to, you know, to myself and be selfish, <laughs> you know, with them. And my mom is here, which is great, but it's like, oh, now she's here without my dad. So, you know, ultimately, I think now what I'm learning, and I think that this is something we can talk about is how can we get to that point where we're able to enjoy life again. A part of the human experience is embracing the pain of grief and going through the process, but it's also um, allowing yourself to enjoy um, what life, what, what you still have, you know, having that gratefulness. How can we remain grateful um, even in the process of grief? This is probably gonna sound like a real like, <laughs> philosophical answer, but it's so true. It's really like one step at a time. Um, the more we allow ourselves to release the grief, to release mm. the tension, to release the pain, the more we allow ourselves to release those feelings and those emotions, the more we can find, the easier we'll find gratitude and joy, right? It's hard to find gratitude when you're hurting when you're mm. in pain, right? It's hard to find gratitude when you are, yeah, when you're grieving. There are sometimes where it's hard to find it in that process of grief. But if you allow yourself, excuse me, if you allow yourself to release it, if you allow yourself to express it, if you allow yourself to continue to move through the process, 
then it, it then then the gratitude is easier to see. Uh, the mm -hmm. joy is easier to come by because you're not just in. Here we go. If you make a fist, right? There's nothing that can get in this hand with a fist, right? Yes. But when you release the pain and you release the hurt and the anger and the devastation and all that, now your hand is open and you can receive, right? You can't even, you can't even, you can't even see it because the only thing you see is the pain. The only thing you see, you remember like playing hide and seek and you would put your hand over your finger or put your, goodness, put your hand over your finger. <laughs> you your eye, but you would do like this so you could try to see, right? Yep. Like you can't even do that because, because of all that pain that's there, right? So, so the more you allow yourself to release it, you can even, you can see it. You can feel it like mm. it becomes a, a sensory experience. Because when one part of you is grieving, really all of you is grieving because it's holistic, right? Yeah. When one part of you, when one, when, when it's not one part, all of, all of our, our entire being grieves. We have to allow ourselves to go through the process. Is it going to happen overnight? No. There are no. some things that will happen overnight, but grief is not. You don't, you don't go to sleep and wake up and be like, I grieved in my dream. I'm good. You may have grieved in your dream and you might be good for now, but you better believe that grief is going to show up again because it's, it's a part, it's a process. It's part of life. Yeah. It's a journey for sure. And I love what you said about that. I can almost imagine um, being in that moment of just pain and grief and survivor's guilt, all, all those different things and memories and the future and all those things just kind of filling you up so much. And I just really, when you started talking, the first thing I heard God say was you have to make room. You have to make room and pour out some of those things and allow that pain to happen and allow the tears to come and allow, you know, release the anger, release those things. Really just, I know it sounds easier said than done, but really casting your cares on him and giving it to him and allowing yourself to almost dump yourself out of it. Not that it won't come again, but so that you can get rid of that fist and be able to open your hands and really allow God to show you how much he's still with you, how much he still has for you, how much he still has for your family and allow him to pour into you because now there's room. Like you said, when you're in that hurt and you're in that pain, you can't see, you're not even allowing yourself to see um what's possible or you know especially after a divorce or or you know something like that there's like oh i'm never getting married again just ne <laughs> never again and you know never that you the more you hang on to that and the more that you you know hang on to the past and you look for those same qualities you know what i'm saying it's like you're you're first of all more liable to repeat the same cycle because you're not allowing yourself to really heal mm -hmm. and you're denying yourself more of the here and denying yourself more of that human experience you're denying yourself of god's best for you and what his purpose might be and he's trying to show you so much more so i appreciate you you know reminding us that even in the grief there's still hope yeah. there's still hope for yeah. you know a future and a hope for you and a future and a hope for you know your your life and god's plan for you you just have to release <laughs> Allow yourself to go through that process, lean on him, know that God's been through it, know that Jesus has been through it, you know, and allow him to pour into you. So I really, really appreciate that. I think that is probably the best way to <laughs> kind of wrap this up. Do you have any um, final thoughts or can you let us know where we can find you or if someone is really in that process of, of grief or grieving a life change or death, how can they get a hold of you and, and take advantage of your services? Um, so I will answer that question first. Um, you can go to my website, uh, which is www.rae.com. Um, so that's the easiest way uh, to be able to reach me as far as services are concerned. Um, with, with a final thought, right? Um, just grieve. And nobody can tell you how to do it. 
we can help you with some, we can guide you, but we can't tell you how to do it. Um, allow yourself to grieve, right? Like you said, you, you, we have to make room for that joy and we have to make room for that hope. And if we are so, we are so tensed up by the pain and the hurt, we won't get there. So, so relax and allow yourself to grieve. It's healthier if you do. Absolutely. Miss Ray, Pastor Ray Kareem, <laughs> I appreciate you being on with us. I, I can't tell you how helpful this was to me. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, people who are joined and hung in there are those who are watching this back. I'm hoping that you took something away with this as well. There's just a lot of different things that we grieve in life and you think that you get over one and something else happens and that's just a part of how life goes. So life does happen. Um, but there's a lot that can also still happen for you. So thank you, um, Ray, for that. I know this might be on the spot, um, but can you end us with a little prayer? Send oh, us a you know, that's not a problem. <laughs> I know you got more. Like, like, uh-oh. Like, what's going on? You know, that's not a problem. Um, and so, God, we thank you so much um, for the opportunity and privilege of this day. Uh, we don't know really where June went, God, because tomorrow's July, but thank you for bringing us to it and bringing us through it. Um, thank you for the opportunity that we have to allow ourselves to be human, to feel, to hurt, um, to feel hurt, to feel pain, um, to allow uh, uh, the courage. May we tap into the courage to release it and not hold on to it because there's so much more that you have for us, so much more that you want for us, and we have to make room. May we be mindful um, and aware of how we feel and what we feel. May we be mindful and aware of the ways in which we release those feelings and cope and navigate, that we would do so in healthy ways. Um, may we be reminded, God, that even Jesus wept, that even Jesus felt grief and allowed himself to do so. And if he could do it, we absolutely can and should. Um, thank you for um, this first half of 2020. We may not have done all that we wanted to do or may not be where we want to be, but we thank you, God, for the opportunity and privilege of a second half, a second quarter, um, another chance. May we lean into the courage. May we lean into your presence, your provision, and your power. May we lean into the genius um, that is you within us so that we can be um, our most optimum selves in this second half. Uh, thank you for a great weekend, an extended weekend, a safe weekend, um, a, a weekend that will be fun and or restful, weekends that may be full of activity or still, uh, but may we find the grace and joy in it all. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, give thanks, and know it to be so. Amen. Amen, amen. Um, I did want to mention real quick, um, you have a Facebook group as well. Oh, yeah, um, I do. So. Um, the Facebook group is called Grievers Welcome. Grievers Welcome. And um, yeah, it's about 150 of us in there, 160 of us in there. And, and we growing. support each other the best way we can through these internet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we too. have to. We have to. And it's a great space to, to release with people who understand, who are going through a lot of the same things. And, um, you know, Ray is even vulnerable herself as she goes through different things of grief. So um, I encourage you, if you've lost someone or just in a space of feeling like you need um, that safe space. Grievers Welcome on Facebook is her group. Uh, definitely join. I think there there might be a, a little bit of a process with that. It should be fairly easy though. So make yeah, sure you look, come a in. A couple of questions. A couple questions, just a couple yeah. questions, but um, come in, be kind and, and get look ready to have some encouragement because I know they encourage me um, as well. So thank you all for joining again, Ray. I can't appreciate you enough. I know we'll do this again. You all make sure that you follow Yes, follow Ray on Facebook, check out our website, make sure you subscribe to me if you're on YouTube and you're checking this out. Follow me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram. We're definitely gonna do more wind down and chills. They all might not be this deep, okay? Um, but I felt like this was a way to kind of kick it off and just have some real conversations. So have a great night. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Oh, yes, yeah. have a good one. No, no, I'm just about to say tomorrow, um, July is BIPOC Mental Health Awareness. 
Black Indigenous Persons of Color Mental Health Awareness Month. So July is all about us being able to to get the mental health that we need to get, you know, so, and grief is a part of that. So yeah, here's to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Honestly, I I had never heard of that. I'm not even gonna I lie. I feel a little, a little ashamed. So what is it called? Black and Indigenous? It's, so it's BIPOC, I think. BIPOC is Black Indigenous People of Color, BIPOC Mental Health Month. Yep. Wait, I wrote it yep. down. Yeah, Mental Health Month. It's BIPOC Mental Health Month. So it is a month for mental health just for us. Love it. Love it, love it. All right, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Have a great rest of the, rest of the year. I'm sure I'll see you all again. And yeah, thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye.